All right, well, good afternoon, Huskies. Welcome to April 5th. Uh, today is our uh, second to, well, actually, we're coming to a close for the semester with our Career Tuesdays, but we have a great employer in-house, a federal employer, uh, FDIC, with us today, and three representatives from that company, Matt Parenti, William Hardy, as well as Michael Quint, who is a UConn alum from the class of 2021. Welcome, Michael. Um, just to give a brief introduction of each of the folks we have here today, Matt Parenti is a graduate of Villanova. He majored in finance and minored in accounting and international business. Right out, right out of college, um, Matt started his career with FDIC as a financial institution a uh, specialist and completed formalized training, the formalized training program to, and became a commissioned financial institution examiner in 2014. Uh, and recently he accepted a new role, promotional opportunity in the division of complex institutional supervision and resolution team. Welcome, Matt. It's great to have you here. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, William Hardy. William is a, uh, or should go by Bill. Uh, Bill is a graduate of Canisius College uh, from 91. It's been some time, Bill, <laughs> with a bachelor's in. <laughs> That's right. With a bachelor's in finance. And Bill also has completed his MBA with the University of Massachusetts Eisenberg School of Management. Uh, uh, Mr. Hardy started his career with FDIC also back in 1991 and has developed into a managerial role uh, and currently oversees the on-site bank examination activity for banks headquartered in Connecticut, Western Massachusetts, and Vermont. Bill, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, our UConn alum, Michael Quint, uh, who's a graduate of the class of 2000, I'm sorry, 2021, uh, had a major as a degree in finance and a minor in communications. Uh, and Michael also has a interesting fact was a co-lead manager of the student manage fund the smf fund at uconn his senior year which i have to say i think you guys manage around 1.5 million dollars if i'm not mistaken uh for that fund uh and i was currently with fdic um he also was an intern with fdic in the financial management scholars intern program back in 2020. uh gentlemen welcome uh, thank you so much for you know coming into the university today to, pr to provide us with insights about career opportunities with FDIC. Um, you know, many students are uh, always considering job opportunities um, many times in the corporate side, but also there's a big important uh, aspect to the federal side of jobs. And we've definitely walked into our banks and retail banks and seen signs for FDIC, but we're always curious, what does FDIC do? as far as a business. Uh, so I'd like to open up my first question to anyone here. Um, uh, you know, could you please tell me just a little bit more insight about FDIC, your business market, and what does your company do, Bill or Matt, if you'd wanna jump in? Thanks, Mick. So um, the FDIC, as Mick kind of alluded to, we're an independent agency of the federal government. We were actually basically born out of the Great Depression in 1933. Um, kind of in response to a lot of bank runs that were happening at the time. Um, and people were unfortunately losing their life savings, retirement savings, um, you know, rainy day funds, things like that. And it clearly had a broader impact on the economy as a whole. So um, one of the main goals of the FDIC is to promote basically financial stability and public confidence in the banking system to hopefully prevent anything like that from ever happening again. And so far, knock on wood, that has been the case, and I truly believe that it will happen in the future because the FDIC um, does such a good job at its mission. So essentially, as an independent agency of the federal government, that means while we are all federal employees, um, we are not actually like most federal agencies in that most federal agencies are funded by taxpayer dollars for salaries, benefits, and whatnot, and subject to the con congressional appropriations process when it comes to budgeting. For the FDIC, we're unique in that we raise our funds essentially from levying insurance premiums on banks, kind of like a normal insurance company would do, like Travelers or the Hartford would do, uh, having insurance premiums for car insurance or home insurance. That's basically how we fund our operations and run our, our um, business and pay our salary and everything like that. So in order to achieve this goal of maintaining um, and promoting public confidence in the bank, banking system. And obviously, like I said, that has implications on the economy as a whole. We send examiners to 
do exams of banks. And we have two major divisions that do um, exams for the FDIC. And um, we'll go over each of them today because that's what we really look to hire for out of college because the exam staff is basically the backbone of the FDIC. And basically anything that happens at the FDIC is stems from in some way, shape or form probably the exams that we run. So our two major exam uh, divisions are division of depositor and consumer protection, also sometimes we'll hear us refer to as compliance. And then we have risk management supervision, which um, Bill, Mike, and I all have our backgrounds essentially. And so uh, I'll admit up front, we may be a little biased towards risk management, but um, we do have some experience, some of us in consumer protection or compliance, and we're still gonna give an overview of kind of what each of those divisions do, because like I said, we're looking to hire for both of them. So I'll start with, the division of consumer protection or compliance and uh, kind of like the name implies consumer protection they're really focused with making sure that no harm is done to consumers or potential consumers uh, so what i mean by that is making sure that banks are not discriminating based on race or gender or maybe other protected classes um, there's something called the community reinvestment act which is a major regulation that applies to all of our banks if they ever want to merge with or buy somebody else they have to have an appropriate or satisfactory consumer, sorry, community reinvestment act record. Um, so our consumer protection examiners look at things like that to really make sure, like I said, that all customers and even potential customers of the banks are treated fairly. I'll give it over to Mike to kind of just give a little bit overview of risk management and supervision now. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, so as Matt said, RMS is the division of risk management supervision. Um, and in, in the RMS division, I work as part of a team that examines a bank's financial condition, risk management program, and internal control, internal control structure. Uh, the main focus of RMS is really evaluating the financial stability of our institutions and identifying potential risks within the banks. So we are really risk examiners. We go into these banks and look through all their documents, policies, financial statements, how they're making money, strategies, and et cetera, anything like that. Uh, we also spend a great deal of time talking with bank management and really getting an, a, a good enough understanding of what's really going on at that institution. And in doing all this, we are really just trying to identify the risks as we see them. Fantastic. Well, that's great insight, Michael, as well as Matt. Um, just to follow up a little bit more about that. So kind of understanding the risk management as well as the compliance and consumer protection side of your business. As far as opportunity, you know, opportunities go, uh, are internships available for both sides of the segment of this of these businesses? And um, you know, are they throughout the country? What would students have to do in order to apply, say, for an internship or those that are graduating for a full time role with FDIC? So I have good news and bad news for uh, students who may be interested in internships. The good news is, yes, we do offer them. And yes, they are available throughout the country in uh, a number of our 80 plus offices. The not so great news or bad news, as I would put it, is we don't currently have any internships available at this very moment. We expect to have our next round of internship postings available at the beginning of the fall semester. And our internships um, generally are available to either are rising juniors that are going to become seniors or sophomores and juniors, um, depending on what type of internship and what type of hiring authority that we have available. So I would definitely say be on the lookout on Handshake, um, be in contact with uh, the UConn Career Center staff, um, and you can also feel free to contact us down the road, but we will definitely have internships down the road. We just don't have any at this very moment. And the good thing about the internships is we're not hiring you to make copies or go on coffee runs for us. We're hiring you as an intern to basically do what we do and learn alongside us and experience um, kind of how we do things on a, a normal basis, because it's also a great way to see if we want to extend in full time offer at the end of your internship. If the, the corporate need for hiring is still around and generally it is. Um, and Mike is a perfect example of that as a, I'll say a success story straight from UConn to an intern to a full time position. But the interns are available, um, and honestly, it's sometimes easier to get your foot in the door as an intern in the FDIC just because they're not nearly as competitive, frankly, in terms of how many students apply for an internship 
versus a full-time position. That's fantastic to know. And as far as uh, opportunities go for full-time roles right now, is um, are opportunities again um, spread out throughout the entire country or they're done by certain regions? How's the selection process work and where do students actually go to apply? Should it be through Handshake? Should it be through uh, USA.gov? Um, I'm not sure if you, either Matt or Bill could give it, provide a little more insight about that. Do you want me to take that, Matt? So yeah, all of our all of our uh, hiring does go through USA Jobs, uh, but the interface is through Handshake. Um, but you would not apply through Handshake. Uh, there'd be a link we would provide. Uh, it would take you out to usajobs.gov, um, and that's where all of our hiring is done through. And all of our offices use the same portal. Uh, so when postings go out or job announcements, as we call them, uh, they go out throughout the country for any open locations, um, and people can apply for as many of those locations as they want. Uh, and then based on obviously the competitiveness of those, you get in selected for an interview um, and, and brought through that process. And just one other thing, Mick and Bill, sorry. Um, for our current full-time jobs, we do actually have those available. Uh, it's kind of timely with regards to this event because the application deadline for the current full-time postings is this Thursday, I believe. Whatever April 7th is essentially at 11 59 PM Eastern time. That's so, Thursday. <laughs> yep. Thanks. So it's very timely. Like I said, um, we do have 50 plus full time positions. We're looking to fill under both consumer protection and risk management combined. Um, so I would encourage any interested students that would qualify to go out and look um, handshake. Like Bill said, handshake will lead you through to usajobs.gov, which is where we actually accept and review our applications that come in. Fantastic. And as far as the day-to-day -day for these roles, once a student say goes through the interview process, an offer is actually made and then they, they're in their position, what's that development process look like today? Um, are they mentored? Do they have someone that they're training with, like you said, alongside? Is it rotational based? What does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Not sure if Michael wants to provide his input here. Yeah, yeah, I can jump in here. So it, it there's both a mentorship aspect and it is rotational. So I am a FIS, which is a financial institution specialist. That is my position. And it's really a training program. Um, that's an opportunity to opportunity to like actually work in banks and perform meaningful work to the examination. So I have my own coach who trains me individually, but it's also rotational in the sense that I work with a team of examiners on each bank exam, and this team may change and um, the duties rotate. So different people might be training me on different aspects of the examination each time. But the training and development process as a whole, it's extremely hands-on and extremely beneficial. I have learned so much already and I haven't even been here for a full year yet, wow. but yeah, everyone, everyone I've worked with has been more than willing and enthusiastic to teach me anything I want to know and help train me and help me grow. So it's really been great. That's fantastic, Michael. And given the circumstances working remotely, you're still able to do that uh, in a remote function because prior to COVID, I'm, uh, Assuming that again, as far as the job itself entailed to go to a lot of these institutions, a lot of these banks and kind of drive to location, if you will, uh, like, like Bill was kind of referring to meeting with the folks inside the bank and getting a better understanding of who your customer is and, and the work that needs to be done on a, on a more hands on basis. So uh, it's great that you guys have also been very resilient as well in, in this type of process and change in, in, the, in the job market. Uh, so that's fantastic. Um, and I guess, you know, looking more into the application process and, you know, getting a, a potential call for an interview, what, um, you know, what do you guys look for in a candidate to be successful when it comes to a career Tuesday, uh, a career fair like you went to, Bill? What makes candidates stand out to be successful in order to move on to the next step and actually land an interview with your team? What do you guys look for? Yeah, obviously we look for a great education like you would get at UConn, um, but beyond that, it's really looking for someone who's who has a really good broad uh, business background. 
Uh, any work experience is great, but it's not required. Um, it, the biggest thing I could say is if somebody has good common sense and good analytical skills, um, that's what we're looking for. And somebody who's ready to learn, because um, as Michael mentioned, his process is a very structured training program. It's a, an apprentice model that we use of training where we bring people on and you'll learn by doing. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna show you how to do it. The second time you do it, you're gonna, we're gonna help you do it. The third time you're gonna do it. Um, and then there's somebody there to backstop you. Um, so it's a learn by doing with formal classroom instruction in between. It's a three to four year training program that we put people into uh, that Michael's in the, in the, the process of going through. Um, so again, we're trying to make sure that drinking through that fire hose is manageable. Um, so we just need people that can that can handle that. So we want well-rounded students, uh, people that have demonstrated an ability to learn, uh, and then beyond that, just people who are ready to go. Fantastic. Anything, Matt, that you'd like to add as well, or? Yeah. I, so Bill kind of alluded to it. Uh, previous work experience um, is great if you have it, but it, it's not something that you need to know the ins and outs of banking in order to be successful at this position. So we don't necessarily hold it against you if you don't have. A banking internship or haven't worked as a teller or something in the past, because the whole point of this three and a half to four year training program is to teach you the ins and outs of banking through what all operations, departments, lending, credit, uh, deposit areas look like in a bank, things like that. So if you're willing to learn, that's great. Um, also, because a lot of our work is done in a teamwork environment, if you have experience and you can demonstrate it, that you've worked as part of a team, either on a, a class project or as part of a business society or something like that. And um, even if you have leadership, that's great because within the first few years, um, honestly, you will be in charge of and delegating tasks to people who might have 10, 20, 30 years of experience. And it's nice if you're comfortable, you know, saying, I need you to do this, or I'm going to ask you to do this. And things like that. So, um, if you have that leadership experience, that's also an added bonus. In addition to oral and written communication skills, because a lot of what we do is uh, just communicating with bankers, both well, normally in person, but even in this virtual environment, we're still talking with them. So, verbal and oral communication skills are a uh, plus, especially because sometimes we're talking about highly confidential and or sensitive topics like um, you need to assess if you're paying yourself too much or something like that. That's not something that pretty goes over all that well if you're talking to a banker. Um, and then the written part is because eventually we relay our findings to bank management and the board of directors in a formal written report of exam, which is essentially a legal document at the end of the day, it can be admissible in court to say, this is all of our findings and what we expect bank management to do to fix it. So that's kind of why we look for these certain um, characteristics in in students who uh, want to apply and history has shown us that they're the ones who are the most successful when it comes to um, a career at the FDIC. That's right, because the, the underlying basic requirements are just that you be a business major, have at least six semester hours of accounting, which is two classes, um, you know, have at least a 2.95 QM and be a U.S. citizen. Um, but though, as you mentioned, Mick, the ones that really set themselves apart are the ones that have, have demonstrated the ability to, to jump forward, work in teams, show initiative. So the ways they can do that through application or through the uh, any kind of a career fair process, you know, process where we get to meet them, um, that's that's where it's helpful. That's fantastic. Uh, great insight. Um, you know, we, we always strive to tell students, you know, gaining that additional experience outside of academics and and working in groups and, and being part of clubs and organizations and giving back to the community taking on a leadership component uh, in the work that they do being detail oriented uh, all these kind of things that you guys are alluding to key skills that i think are important that students hear after they watch this video that what employers and specifically fdic looks for in those uh you know uh, great outstanding candidates that really uh, succeed during an interview process. Um, part of that interview, I know, is having that resume. And what's the inside scoop about having, you know, that federal resume and, the, you know, the big comparison necessarily of having a one-page resume? Um, you know, that's probably a, a, a big mislead as far as students knowing that, hey, a resume for the federal side is quite different than, say, just applying for another Fortune 500. <laughs> Not sure if anyone wants to talk about that, Matt or Bill. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. 
So yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the difference between the two is in the private industry, that one pager is meant to catch that hiring manager's attention so that you get an interview. With the FDIC, you know, we reference the fact that everything goes through uh, fdic.usajobs.com.gov, um, sorry. Um, and the application that you fill out, you're gonna fill out your experience both at college as well as um, any work experience you have or cred credentials you have with your, with your profession. And that's what's going to get you the interview. It's really, you know, what's what shows up on paper. But then you, what the what the resume does for the federal government positions is it supports what's on the application. So it, it, if you don't have support for all of the answers in your application, then you're going to screen out. Uh, so, for example, if you put, you know, if a question revolves around oral communication and you put then you've been part of the Toastmasters Club and you've done presentations to people, you know, three groups of 300, but your resume has nothing on it about oral presentations. Well, then the process during the process, they're going to screen that out, just assuming you didn't answer the question well. So the government resume is meant not meant to be contained to one page. Um, so two to three pages for a typical college student is normal. Um, because again, the purpose is not to catch someone's attention. It's to support what's already been completed in the application. So oh, sorry, yeah, Matt, just, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry. Thanks. I'm um, adding on to what Bill said. So a lot of times what I recommend to. Uh, applicants or interested students who want to apply is you literally go basically side by side with your resume and then the application questions that Bill was talking about. And if you go one by one of the application questions, and if you say, yes, I did this, take, for example, Bill's um, example of oral communication experience and history. If you say, yes, I did this, then you look to your resume and say, is it on here somewhere? If not, that's where you put in a few bullet points or something to speak to it. Because otherwise, just like Bill said, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're at risk of not getting credit for having done that um, in our HR and hiring manager uh, hiring manager's eyes. So the biggest takeaway, and it might be a shock for students when you always probably hear drilled into you, one page, one page, one page for the federal government, not just the FDIC, but the federal government as a whole, I assure you that's not the process and not how it works. Absolutely. Uh, that's great, great insight, Matt and Bill, and I'm sure hopefully students are taking, uh, you know, some of these additional notes about federal resumes, and it's a great thing, I think, just to even look over and review, uh, you know, federal resumes in general before you definitely apply on USA.gov. Um, after the resume piece and having, I guess, having the interview process with FDIC, what does that actually look like? Is there going to be a phone screening? Um, do you have multiple rounds of interviews? And then what are the types of questions that students should expect? Are they behavioral, traditional? Not sure if Matt or Bill, you'd like to step in and kind of talk about the interview process with FDIC. I'll take the start on this one and then Bill can fill in the gaps that I'm sure to miss. But essentially, um, after you've applied, on usajobs.gov, your, your application is essentially scored with a certain number of points. And if you score high enough, you will be sent an email within a few weeks of the deadline to take what we call an automated writing assessment. And once you receive that email, you have, I believe, three days to take the automated writing assessment. I think it's either 20 or 25 minutes. And um, the reason we have that up front is because, like I was talking about before, written communication is a big deal for us. So um, we wanna make sure that you can use proper grammar, your written work is generally free of typos, selling mis spelling mistakes, things like that. If you then, um, it's either a pass or fail for the writing assessment. If you pass, you then get um, moved on to the next stage where essentially your points from your application is scored and compared against everybody else who applied for a location that you wanted. So say you put New York City, you're scored against everybody else who wanted to work in and apply to New York City. And then if you're in the top handful, generally maybe three to five, you may be told the FDIC would like to actually have you participate in an interview. Um, so the hiring process has changed over the, few, the past few years, especially during COVID when um, we're not meeting in person and everything. So as it currently stands, the interview is a, a virtual interview over Microsoft Teams or a similar um, virtual method or portal. And it's what we call a structured interview. So kind of like the resume for a federal government job is different than a private sector resume. A structured interview is probably unlike anything that uh, students would have ever experienced either interviewing for real or in a mock interview that's done or anything like that. And what I mean by that is the structured interview 
is designed to put everybody on the same footing. Everybody who applies to the position is asked the same number of questions in the same order. I promise your interviewers are not robots, but they will essentially act like robots in the interview. Um, there will likely be no follow up questions. Um, there may be the opportunity for a simple clarifying question, but that's about it. But the main topic and focus of the structured interview is you. It's things like, tell me about a time where you might have done this or had this experience, and you want to back that up. So the best way to really prepare for a structured interview generally is to think about what you have done in the past and think of maybe examples that you can use for teamwork or analytical assignments or um, problems that you ran into when doing a project, things like that. So I promised I would probably forget some things, so I'll now let Bill take over and fill in what I may have missed or forgotten. The only thing I would add, Matt, is with regards to that last piece, you know, the um, think of examples, uh, the, the structured interview questions are all based on soft skills. So at that point, we already know you have the technical skills, the background, the credentials that we're looking for. So you've already made that cut. Now we're just trying to find people who are the best fit. So then the questions are going to revolve around the soft skills, like Matt said, you know, teamwork um, and interpersonal and problem solving and all those those challenges that you've worked through. And you can use, I mean, it's common to use examples from classroom, you know, projects or from your college experience. Again, this is an entry level position into the corporation. So we're not expecting somebody already has, you know, tremendous credentials or experience, you know, managing, you know, teams of people, uh, but everybody's obviously been involved in class projects. Um, and those comes with challenges. So how did you deal with those? And, and that's the, really the questions are based around that. Fantastic, great, great insight, Matt and Bill. Thank you so much. I guess I have another question, maybe even for Michael here. Um, how would you describe the company culture at FDIC now being part of the team? Um, what's your favorite, you know, part about working for the organization? Yeah, the culture, the culture is extremely supportive. That is instantly the first word that comes to mind when I hear that question. I don't feel that anyone is competing against me or trying to make me look bad or going behind my back, anything like that. I feel more like if I have any sort of question about something technical involving banking or anything that's bothering me in my life and work, anything, I could reach out to pretty much any one of my teammates, coworkers, and they'll be extremely supportive and willing to help me and everyone else on the team. That's, yeah. fantastic. That's fantastic. Bill and Matt, how about for you guys? What's your favorite part about being part of the team at FDIC? Obviously, you've, you've um, you know, Bill, you've been there for some time and Matt as well. Um, I guess, you know, as far as takeaway for students, what what's some of the, the, the you know, the, the, the benefits of being part of the FDIC team and, and the, the camaraderie within uh, within the organization. Yeah, I can start if you want, Matt. Um, yeah, so for me, there's two reasons I, I have stayed at the organization as long as I have. Um, the first one is the people I work with. Uh, we work, we hire really high caliber people like Mike uh, and Matt. Um, so I'm working with people already that are, expect a lot of themselves that have very high standards. Um, and it's great to work in that environment where we're always trying to do things better. Uh, the second is because it really is the, the, the job itself and the way the, the FDIC supports people. Training is paramount, not just during that three and a half to four year training program that Michael's in, but beyond that, then you get you get a professional learning account that you know, you're in, not just entitled to use, but encouraged to use to get additional training every year of your career. Um, and for example, I mean, as the, the financial industry has evolved really, really quickly in the last five to 10 years, you know, staying current with cryptocurrencies and fintech, um, I've been using my professional learning account to really try to make sure I stay in front of that because that's what the, the banks are dealing with. They're competing against fintechs, either partnering with them or literally competing against them, finding ways to make better digital presence um, instead of just bricks and mortar. So as banks have evolved, the financial industry has evolved, I've had to evolve with it and the FDIC supports that uh, both with monetarily and, and with time. So I just feel like I'm continually on this, this, this ride where it just keeps accelerating and I get to be on the front of the, the front car of the, of the roller coaster. So it's a lot of fun. That's 
Go ahead. I'm sorry, Matt. Go ahead. I think oh, you were right. um, so I'm going to kind of echo a little bit what Mike said with the culture and what he likes. Uh, so I was a finance major coming out of college. A lot of the things I'd heard about was go work on Wall Street. Um, but right or wrong, my impression of that was you're working 80 hours a week. You don't um, have any time to really spend with friends or family because you're always at work. You're working late nights and weekends, things like that. The FDIC, thankfully, is nothing like that. Work-life balance really means it. We um, support it. You get plenty of leave and you're essentially expected to take it. Um, a 40 hour work week really is a 40 hour work week. If you work beyond that, you're compensated in some way, shape or form. And that's generally pretty rare anyway. And then again, just the people are great. Um, echoing what Bill and Mike said, the people that I started with, we started across the country, but, um, I went to many of their weddings. They were, you know, made lifelong friends, even though if I moved or if they've left the corporation, we all still keep in touch. So. It's really nice to not have to worry about any sort of backstabbing or anything like that. Again, um, we're all in it for the same purpose and we all realize that we work together to, to get the FDIC's mission done. So. Fantastic insight. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's great to hear from your true perspectives, you know, based off of the experiences and uh, you guys definitely bring a lot of experience to the table with the FDIC, which is fantastic. Um, you know, at this point, I'm just going to transition to um questions but i guess before uh i do I, I as far as a takeaway goes i know bill you were kind of alluding to the cryptocurrency markets and um you know fintechs of the industry where do you see fdic and uh you know in the next five years is that something that's going to segue you think into the organization as well kind of uh getting a better grasp of cryptocurrencies for, for within the banking realm no question um as the financial services industry evolves, um, the FDIC has to as well. Uh, as Matt, Matt mentioned, our very mission is to provide stability in the financial system. And the FDIC, along with the other federal regulators, um, are actually doing a study uh, that we started uh, about a year ago um, on cryptocurrency, digital assets. Um, and then um, the president, President Biden actually has just been uh, charged the federal government agencies with with making sure that this gets done quickly. Um, so the government agencies are, are working on this actively to, to get into this space because banks are in it, uh, financial, you know, financial services firms, everywhere you go, you can see Bitcoin and other, you know, ether, ether and that and everything else. Uh, it's there, there's, there's um, currencies, there's also exchanges that are trading it. So it's there, so now how do we deal with it? So it's a policy issue as well as a, a risk management issue. Um, so it's it's here, and we we're really trying to get um, get in front of that as best we can. It's fantastic. It's excellent to know. I'm sure that's going to be a a big uh, you know shift in, in uh, FDIC's world as well. Mm -hmm. um, I do we do have a question from a student here. Uh, it's more of a question for Michael actually. What else would you tell uh, current students here at UConn? Uh, how to get more involved aside just from SMF in order to stand out in an interview with FDIC? Yeah, so of course, anything you do where you can develop your analytical skills more and learn more about business and how businesses work as a whole is beneficial. But I would say more importantly, get yourself involved in things where you can really work as part of a team, develop those teamwork and leadership skills, um, as well as oral and written communication skills. Those are all really important for this job and the interview process. So for, for me, SMF was kind of, kind of perfect because it kind of wrapped up all those concepts into one thing. I was part of a team. I learned a ton about businesses. I had to present, I had all that. But other things, I was also in the finance society. I know that's really good. There's, there's, uh, many different case competitions, all that stuff where you can really develop those teamwork and communication skills. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael, for that input. And I think that was our last question. So at this time, I would just like to thank you, Bill, Matt, and Michael for coming in to, to UConn uh, on behalf of the faculty and staff here at the university. We greatly appreciate your support and looking out for UConn students for potential internships as well as full-time opportunities with the organization. We look forward to having you in the fall and thank you again for coming in today and so long. Our pleasure, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.